case of Plateau Cairo. The Sphinx was carved out of solid bedrock over 7,000 years ago, which is the most conservative estimate, according to geologist Robert Schock. This conclusion was reached due to the obvious heavy water erosion. The last time there was heavy rain in the Sahara was at the end of the last ice age. Logic dictates that it was likely constructed well before that worldwide upheaval, so that makes it likely over 12,000 years old. Note those massive, highly eroded curved blocks to the left. That's the Sphinx Temple, constructed with blocks cut out of the bedrock when the Sphinx was carved. Those huge weathered blocks of limestone were cut out of the Sphinx enclosure. They sit atop perfectly carved blocks of rose granite from the quarry at Aswan, 500 miles away which sit on a foundation of perfectly carved and flattened limestone bedrock. The interior of the Valley Temple is even more impressive with its perfectly flattened, dry-fitted columns of rose granite, again from Aswan, 500 miles away. Despite the consensus among many geologists and so-called alternative researchers, mainstream archaeologists and Egyptologists still cling to the conservative date of around 4,500 years ago for the construction of the Sphinx, or around the same time that the Great Pyramids were supposedly built. Among others, Graham Hancock theorizes that it once had the head of a lion, as the monument would have been pointing directly at the Leo constellation 12,000 years ago. It was probably carved into the likeness of the pharaoh Khafre when he ruled Egypt 4,500 years ago. Others theorize that it was more likely the Comitian god Anubis, as it bears more resemblance to a dog than a lion. The Sphinx was buried up to its neck until the late 1800s. Who knows how many times it's been buried, forgotten and then rediscovered. Luckily, another recent discovery supports the fact that human civilization goes back at least 12,000 years. Gobekli Tepe, Turkey. This is just one of the 20 or more sewn circles dated 8 to 10,000 years BC currently being excavated. Each features two giant stone pillars surrounded by a ring of smaller T-shaped pillars. The largest of these stone pillars are up to 6 meters tall and close to 50 tons. Some display complex carvings of animals from other continents which indicate there were probably already well-established trade networks or at least regular contact and travel between different regions. Others look like depictions of animals which died out before the last ice age. We're told that when Gobekli Tepe was constructed, humans were nomadic hunter-gatherers. Extended family groups moving with the seasons following herds of animals with crude stone tools and primitive improvised shelter. Mainstream archaeologists still cling to this chronology when attempting to explain Gobekli Tepe. According to them, it was the first temple ever, made by groups of hunter-gatherers. How exactly they suddenly progressed from making reed and mud huts to massive megalithic stone circles seems to have been overlooked. Construction of that scale and sophistication should take centuries of evolution of skills and techniques passed down and refined over many generations. Technological progress does not happen overnight. We are told that the trappings of civilization, such as writing, literature, laws, education, government, cities, banks, money, usury, debt, architecture, metallurgy, etc., appeared suddenly in Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, and China between around 4,000 and 2,000 years BC, pretty much independently. Here we see an ancient Sumerian cuneiform tablet, supposedly the first ever form of written language. Tablets like this one were made by pushing a blunt reed stylus into soft clay, which was then fired. Tablets like this one were created by cylinder seals, the printing press of the era. Here's how they worked. So 
According to the conventional chronology, technology of that level appeared suddenly and independently in several places. Even more strange, judging by the quality of the stone masonry, the only artifact still pretty much intact after thousands of years, technology has regressed steadily. Examples of this are everywhere. Abydos Temple, Egypt. The Osirian. Often, literally, the deeper you dig, the more advanced it gets. This ancient megalithic temple is below water level. This means it was most likely constructed during the last ice age. His obvious similarities to the Sphinx temple seem to confirm this. Cusco, Peru, the convent of Santo Domingo. This was the heart of the Inca capital who most likely found this area with its incredible ancient ruins, possibly attributed to their gods, the Viticocha, and decided it was the perfect place to settle. It was known to the Inca as the Codicancha. Fortunately, much of the pre-Inca masonry was beyond the means of the Spanish to destroy, so relics of their amazing stonework still exist. The Spanish reused the stone of the buildings they demolished. It looks like many of the larger granite blocks were beyond their ability to use or even cut. Inca lore states there have been three ages as depicted in this often used three-step motif. Hanam Pacha, Urun Pacha and Ukun Pacha. Hanam Pacha, or the first world, is characterized by shapes, steps, rooms, temples, caves, etc. cut right into the bedrock, often with precise angles and perfectly smooth flat surfaces. The scale of this is sometimes mind-boggling, showing signs of tools and technology we haven't even come close to conceiving of today. These carvings often have no discernible function, as they were sacred to the Inca. Of course, they're now known as religious sites, the default archaeological term to categorize unknown structures, it seems. They often show evidence of major cataclysm with massive chunks of intricately carved former bedrocks scattered around like the building blocks of some humongous toddler. They are often seen carved around natural fissures in the rock. The vast system of tunnels under Cusco, which are said to cover most of South America, were most likely carved in this era. It's evident that at the time of construction, some of the surfaces would have been perfectly flat and polished. Some surfaces even seem to be vitrified, a process in which extreme heat melts the surface, resulting in a glass-like finish. This is impossible to achieve with hand tools and polishing alone. Studies suggest that the effect may have been achieved by a process similar to ceramic glazing of pottery. In our world, that can only be done in a kiln. Could this be the work of the so-called god founders of the pre-Inca world, the Viticocha? It's not as crazy as it sounds, but I'll get into some speculation in the next episode. Now to Urum Pacha, the second world. This is the era of polygonal masonry. It's often seen fitted perfectly around Hanam Pacha stonework as seen in this picture. Possibly the most spectacular example of Urum Pacha masonry is in Sacsayhuaman, just outside of Cusco, Peru. The blocks, ranging from about 2 to 200 tons, are carved out of limestone and fit together perfectly despite their different shapes and sizes. This may seem haphazard, but it's actually an incredibly advanced construction technique, as in the event of an earthquake, the stones can move without compromising structural integrity. Regularly sized rectangular blocks would not have anywhere near this kind of stability. 
Archaeologists will tell us that the Inca built this using bronze, chisels and stone hammers, all within a few years before the Spanish arrived. This is of course impossible, as it's doubtful such a feat could be accomplished with modern technology, according to the people who would actually know, stonemasons. Of course this is not taken into consideration or it's just ignored by archaeologists who must adhere to the mainstream chronology. To them, the notion that ancient cultures were more advanced than us is unacceptable, despite the worldwide evidence. This brings us to Ukun Pacha, the Third World. This is the time of the Inca who formed an empire encompassing most of South America west of the Andes by assimilating surrounding tribes. They received the same high standard of living and prosperity as the rest of the empire. Peace usually prevailed, but the conquest made some dangerous enemies. This may have caused the downfall of the Inca when some sided with the Spanish, whom some mistook for the Viracocha as it was foretold that they'd return that year. It's a deeply sad piece of history. They accomplished some astonishing feats of engineering. This construction is thought to be a terrace farming system designed to create different temperatures and levels of humidity to grow crops of different kinds. It is thought by others to be a giant amphitheater or maybe a combination of the two. All speculation of course, who knows really what its function was. Better than the usual lines from mainstream archaeology, it served a ceremonial or religious purpose or as a temple complex. Are you starting to see the pattern? At Machu Picchu we can see three distinct styles of construction in one undeniably incredible location. Note that Inca masonry built on top of the perfectly carved polygonal blocks with scattered remains of the carved bedrock of Tanam Pacha. Considering the technology they had at their disposal, the Inca did an incredible job of rebuilding the partially destroyed ancient sites they settled around. The mountain roads, rope bridges and terracing they built over 500 years ago are still maintained and used today. But compared to whoever created this, the work of the Inca looks primitive. What kind of technology could possibly have scooped close to 1 million cubic meters of siltstone, harder than granite, out of the 36 chambers which have been found so far, with a combined area of around 30,000 square meters? the Longyu Caves in China. Each cave is around 30 meters deep and 140 meters long. The ceilings are supported by pillars shaped from the bedrock. The precision is incredible, with each cave almost identical. The walls between each one are only 50 centimeters thick. Surprisingly, the caves are completely separated. As to what the caves were for, we can only speculate. They display a similar degree of precision, technology and scale to the ancient pyramids. Both are built over freshwater aquifers. Is it possible they performed a similar function? Of course, archaeologists assure us it was carved painstakingly with crude bronze chisels. Much like this unfinished obelisk at the Aswan Quarry that I mentioned before, I'm guessing similar technology was used at both sites. Maybe it was something mechanical similar to what we'd use today in places like this. A potash mine in Utah. These markings bear an uncanny resemblance to what we see at the Long New Caves and at the Aswan Quarry. This gypsum mine in Ukraine has been worked by a similar but less adorable excavator. The obviously mechanical gouge marks, which are even more prominent in a softer material, are very similar to those found in some of the Longyu Caves, which are close to the public. Let's see what we could use today to lift and move some of the giant stones the ancients built with. These front-end loaders at a marble mine in Greece could move some of the smaller blocks used in the Great Pyramid at about 2-4 to four tons, provided there are roads at the site and machines like these. This Libya crane is the largest road going crane in the world. Although it boasts a capacity of 1200 tons, there's really no situations in which that would be practical as it can only handle that weight at a 2.5 meter radius unextended. This chart shows what it can really lift at different heights and radii. Impressive assuming that you can actually get it to your site. If not, I'm pretty sure our heavy lift helicopters could do the rest, right? Let's have a look. 
The Russian MIL MI-12 holds the record for heavy lift choppers at about 40 tonnes. Unfortunately, it never made it to production. That leaves its little brother, the MI-26, capable of lifting about 20 tonnes. Surely that's adequate, right? Oliante Tambu, Peru. At over 2,700 metres above sea level on the ridge of a mountain, this is one extreme construction site. Above these ancient fortifications, discovered and repaired to the best of their abilities by the Inca, we find six blocks of rose granite carved from a quarry seven miles across the valley, averaging close to 100 tonnes each. A crane like this one may be sufficient, with its reach of close to 250 metres and a capacity of 3,500 tonnes. Sounds impressive, but again this is only on paper. The capacity drops to 65 tonnes at maximum height and less as its boom lowers its angle. It might have been handy building something like this. Baalbek, Lebanon. Home of the legendary Trilithon. Three perfectly carved in place stones weighing around a thousand tons each. Sitting on top of a row of 450 ton blocks, each perfectly carved and fitted. But these are just numbers. How heavy is 1000 tons in real terms? As heavy as this many original Volkswagen Beetles, multiplied by 9, haha, <laughs> that's 1170 small cars, or 15 full Airbus A320s. Or 4 Statue of Liberties. So that's 1170 cars, 15 jetliners and 4 massive statues, making up 3 ancient building blocks. And we're taught to consider the builders of this as primitive, because you know what? I'm calling gigantic, golden, galactic bullshit.